I'm Sam Roberts of The New York Times, and welcome to The New York Times Close Up. There's a new documentary on HBO about two titans of New York journalism, Jimmy Breslin and Pete Hamill. I'll speak with one of the directors, Jonathan Alter, a little later on. But first, there's an important city election coming up on Tuesday, February 26th for Public Advocate. The field this year is crowded, 17 candidates running for a job that was almost abolished the last time a charter commission seriously considered it. I'm joined by former public advocate Betsy Gottbaum. Welcome, Betsy. And as I recall it, the last time the, count, the Charter Commission seriously considered it, it was 1989, and the job was kept more or less as a sop to Andy Stein, who was the city council president. It kept this job so he could still be council president. The name was changed to public advocate. Mark Green kept the job, got the job, uh, and then he served under a Republican mayor, Rudy Giuliani, or with a Republican mayor. So there was an adversarial relationship. You succeeded him with a Republican mayor, or ostensibly one, Mike Bloomberg. But now we've got a strong uh, controller, arguably. We have a stronger city council. We have an independent budget office. Uh, do we still need a public advocate? Absolutely. And I will fight anybody to the death who says we don't. Because what people don't seem to understand, and many of the candidates who are running didn't seem or don't seem to understand, this is a job that helps people who are really desperate and have no place else to turn. The, the charter says that the public advocate is the ombudsman for the city of New York. That means you take, you look, you have oversight over city agencies. When you hear about a problem, you try to solve that problem for people, help them, and sometimes you get to a much bigger problem. Let me give you one example. Um, a, a man from a homeless shelter called me, called the office, and said he couldn't get food stamps for himself and his children. I got to the point of investigating it because it was such an extraordinary story. Uh, the, the application for food stamps was 16 pages long. I couldn't fill it out. So after a long time, I was able to bring that application down to four pages. And it helped a lot of people get food stamps. Now, if people think that that isn't important to citizens of this city, I defy them to, to, to I really defy them to argue that with me. And there are many, many more examples of, of issues like that where I was able, where Mark, Mark was much more combative because he had a much more competitive mayor. But we were able to do things that nobody else is doing. Why the public advocate? Why can't people go to their councilman or someone like that? People can go to their councilman, but I think you would find that a citywide elected official has much more opportunity to get the agency that you're looking over to do something. I mean, remember, the council people only represent their, their uh, constituent, their districts. I always believed, and I still believe it, that the public advocate's office should be connected to all the constituent offices, to 311, and all be done electronically, so that we all work together to figure out from one problem, what are the big trends that are going wrong in the city? That is something that I've always wanted to do. I think uh, Speaker Corey Johnson wants to do that too, which is, a, which is absolutely right. Um, and it is important. New Yorkers need help. The council is considering mulling charter revisions again, yes. too. What should be done with the public advocate to make it more efficient, more effective? Well, first of all, I would the first thing I would do is give it a baseline budget, not have it be at the whim of the mayor to control the budget of the public advocate. I mean, mayor gets furious at the public advocate for criticizing, say, something going on in in a, a, a agency for children's services, and that cuts the budget. That happened to me a lot. Uh, so that that's the first thing: a baseline budget that is more than three million. I think it should be five million. I think it should then. There, another thing that should be considered is having the public advocate connected to three one one and connected to the constituent officers, offices. Sorry. Mm -hmm. the, there are seventeen people <laughs> running in this race. This is a nonpartisan election, uh, which means people make up their own parties. Right. You don't know who's a Democrat, who's a Republican. Anyone can make up a name. Uh, is this an argument for nonpartisan elections? Is it 
just silly. Uh, and considering if you do the math, uh, somebody can get elected with roughly 1% of the total number of registered voters in the city. And not only that, mm -hmm. Sam, they have to run again probably in June mm -hmm. and then run again in November. It is silly and that should be changed. Uh, this is a special election which occurred because the former public advocate became the attorney general and this is just the way it is. That should be changed. We should look at that in the charter commission of the city council that's coming up this year uh, and see what changes can be made. You're the executive director of Citizens Union. How did you decide whom to endorse? What are the criteria? Uh, what are the qualifications for a public advocate? And how did you pick yours? Well, first of <clears> all, the, the, the system at, the, at Citizens Union is very, very intense. We have members who all meet. They're all volunteers. They meet. They, they look at all the questionnaires that, they, that the people send in. A lot of the ca candidates did not so, not a lot. Some of the candidates didn't finish, didn't do their questionnaires. Automatically, we didn't interview them if they didn't. So they, they look at the questionnaires, they interview the candidates. It's a very extensive, it's, it's a very thrilling process because it's democracy at work. Mm -hmm. And they talk it over and they fight and they do this and they do that and then they vote on somebody to win and they, and they did rank choice voting. I, I sat there. I'm not allowed to vote. I'm like a fly on the wall, believe that. It's true. Um, and then they voted, and in, in this case, they voted for Michael Blake. And the reason was that they felt that he had the best uh, concept of the job and how to do the job and what would be the most effective. They thought that he would be the most effective person in the role of public advocate. What made him stand out as opposed to the others? Well, he actually talked about the ombudsman function, which is what it says in the charter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, other people were talking about fixing student debt and um, the, the whole issue of land use. And, and there are roles that the public advocate can play in those areas, and particularly in the MTA. I agree, and Michael Blake said he wants the public advocate to have a seat on the MTA. Other candidates did too. That makes a lot of sense. But he seemed to have the best knowledge of what the office, which is the ombudsman function. I would hope whoever wins on Tuesday comes to you and says, hey, What's your best advice? What would you tell him or her? Well, I would tell him exactly what I've said to you. Really focus on the ombudsman function of the office. Have a lot of people working there in that function and then figuring out what are the big trends in the city that are going forward that you can work on and you can become known for looking at the small issues and turning them into big issues. Do you need more power to be able to do that? to be more effective think, in doing it? I don't think so. I think, I think if you have a baseline budget so that you know that if you criticize the mayor or the, or the agencies that you're not going to have your budget cut, to me that's much more effective and much more efficient. Uh, so that would be one of the first things I would say. Fight to get a baseline budget and stop talking about subpoenaing because you're not going to get subpoena power. Many of the candidates talked about subpoenaing, subpoena this one, subpoena that one. Forget it. You're not going to get subpoena power. Let me ask you about two issues that came up in the last debate among the public yep. advocates. You have the good fortune of not running this time. Amazon, if Jeff Bezos came and sat at this table and said, look, OK, I'm back at the table. Here's the deal that I negotiated with the mayor and the governor. Take it or leave it. What would you do? Well, first of all, I would take it. And I would try to work out some issues that, that to me were very important. It seems to me that if there could be job development in the Queensboro, Queensbridge houses, that would be a very important issue. There are an enormous number of people. It's the largest housing project in the United States. If there were real job opportunities for the people that live in those houses, that would be a terrific idea, one. Two, everybody gives subsidies for for uh, people coming into New York, for businesses coming into New York. What's the big deal? I mean, I'm questioning why nobody questions some of the local politicians about the tax uh, benefits they gave to the movie industry for coming into that part of Queens. It's the same thing. What's the difference? So I would say to Mr. Bezos, look, let's negotiate. What are some of the things you can do for this community? And I believe that the ancillary things that happen, the small businesses that grow up. It's happened in Seattle. To me, I would talk to him about that and say, look, it's, it's going to be tough. We have to work this out. I do believe I heard that the unions had negotiated somewhat of a settlement on Wednesday night before Amazon pulled out. I'd say, why did you do that? 
I think that he was fed up with a lot of the maneuverings that were going on. I would say to him, don't be fed up. We'll work it out. The other issue, the mayor, whether he should run for president. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone is asking him to run for president, <laughs> but what do you think? Uh, I think there's so many problems in New York with the MTA, with NYCHA, with many of the agencies which need leadership and help in getting them to do their jobs, particularly about homelessness. I don't think the mayor should be thinking about running for president. I, I, there are enough people running for president, and he has a big job to fill. Almost here. as many as Republicans? That's right. There are almost as many. Thanks to Betsy Gottbaum, the executive director of Citizens Union, for joining us. And Coming up next, Jonathan Alter, one of the three directors of the new HBO documentary, Breslin and Hamill, Deadline Artists. <music> Among my great joys as city editor of the Daily News was having the columnists Jimmy Breslin and Pete Hamill as colleagues. Each captured New York uniquely, now an HBO documentary has captured them. It's called Breslin and Hamill, Deadline Artists, directed by Jonathan Alter, John Block, and Steve McCarthy. Jonathan joins us. He's an award-winning journalist. And, of course, John Block, Steve McCarthy, Emmy Award-winning directors as well. Jonathan, what prompted you to do this documentary? Well, you know, I ran into Jimmy Breslin's stepdaughter, Emily Eldridge. You know, the Eldridges are in the family here. Yep. Right? And um, uh, we live in the same uh, town, Montclair, New Jersey. And I've known Jimmy. I had known him for many years, 30 years. Um, and I asked how he was doing, and she said that uh, he wasn't doing so well. Uh, he wasn't in great health. I said, has anybody gone around with a camera just to get some of his old stories? And, and she said, people have tried, but then it never really happened. So Steve and John and I, Steve with his camera, he's a cinematographer as well as a director, uh, we just started going to see Jimmy and Pete. And we went and picked Pete up. He was living in lower Manhattan at that time. And we take him up to Jimmy's apartment. And we just started shooting, getting their old stories, talking to them. And then we started gathering archival. And the amazing thing, Sam, is when we started to ask people if they would sit for interviews, I wasn't that surprised that you agreed. But you know, we had Robert De Niro, Shirley MacLaine, Tom Wolfe in his last uh, television interview, uh, um, Colin Quinn, the comedian, Spike Lee, uh, these great journalists from the New York Times uh, like you and Dan Barry and Jim Dwyer, Gail Collins. Gay Talese. Gay Talese and many more that I won't go into. But the point is, nobody said no. The only person who refused to be in the film was David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, mm -hmm. who sent me a polite no note. To sent you a letter like right, he did to right, Jimmy Breslin. Right, right. <laughs> but other than that, because, and this just tells you how big Jimmy Breslin and Pete Hamill were in this city and the, the, the swath that they cut and how interested people were in in, in other people remembering two great journalists who spoke truth to power. You've been in uh, journalism for decades. Uh, you know a lot about every aspect of it. Did you learn anything about journalism doing this film? I think I was reminded of what is at the core of what we do, which I always new, but it, it's important to be reminded that you, know, you, you, do, you really do have to get out and it, it, there's such a temptation. Some young reporters now, and there are a lot of terrific ones, I want to stress, but some of them, they don't even pick up the phone. You know, they, they don't leave their computer they, screen. They literally think they can do their job on the computer. And Jimmy and Pete not only rejected that, but they rejected doing everything by phone. And they, they stressed that you had to go out and old shoe leather, climb the stairs, get out there, and that you, uh, that was the only way you were really going to get good stories that had those little details that really make a story. Let's take a look at Jimmy talking about uh, covering uh, Bobby Kennedy's assassination. I went to Dallas on November 22nd, 1963, when Kennedy was shot. And I thought that every minute of every hour I ever had worked had prepared me for writing about this. 
This is a marvelous emotion for you to have when a guy with a wife and two children gets shot. That is called news reporting. You know, you have the press conference, and everybody gets the same information. So you all go off and you write it differently, but it's the same pool of information. Most journalists would have said, fine, I have enough. I have an incredible deadline. But this was the essence of Breslin. Breslin said, no, I don't have enough. I want more. I want more than every other person, every other journalist who's in this room right now. And so he pursued Malcolm Perry, and he got an interview with him where he found out everything down to what the guy was eating for lunch when the call came that Friday afternoon. Could Breslin and Hamill exist in the digital age, or did they have to be in print? Did they have to be in newspapers? Uh, could they survive and have the same impact today? Well, um, they would not be hosting Saturday Night Live as Jimmy did in the mm -hmm. 80s. The idea of a, you know, a print journalist, just impossible to imagine. And Pete Hamill was going out with Jackie Onassis, the most famous woman in the world, and Shirley MacLaine, a huge movie star, at the same time. You wouldn't see a print journalist doing that today. But in terms of the reporting, what we just saw that clip, uh, that was Nick Pileggi in part talking right. there. To go where other reporters aren't, to find the fresh angle, that never goes out of style. I mean, and, and anybody who wants to break through in the business has to be able to do that. But to do it at the level that these guys uh, did, uh, you know, we will see it again. I, I'm not seeing it right now, but I do think that they, they do have some real airs. And, and, you know, in terms of being on the streets like uh, Jim Dwyer and Dan Barry and others at the New York Times and, and at some of the uh, tabloids, but their staffs have been cut so badly that uh, there are not as many at the tabloids as there used to be. But there are still people doing this work. They're just not going to be um, giants walking the earth the way these guys were. They were giants, I think, and maybe I'm being old-fashioned in part because there they were in something tangible that you could hold in your hand, yeah. that newsboys uh, sold out on the street that were on the newsstand. Do they, would they have the same impact on a screen, digitally, in a podcast? Or might they have more impact because they might reach more people? Well, they, you know, we do have uh, people who are on multi-platforms. You know, they're, they're writing, they're on television, they're doing podcasts. So we do have, obviously, well-known uh, journalists now. But one of the problems is if you're so busy tweeting and, you know, doing your podcast and your daily TV show, it's a little hard to go out and get the stories of ordinary people. So these guys were covering, you know, the death of a president, but also ordinary people, the Latina cop who's fired for posing nude uh, before mm -hmm. she's a police officer. You know, Jimmy saves her job. Or standing up on something like the Bernard Getz case, the subway gunman uh, who, you know, uh, shot four unarmed black teenagers. It, the idea of somebody every day against the tide standing up at the local level it's increasingly rare, mostly because of budgets. I think at the national level, Sam, we've got some fantastic reporting going on now about Trump. It wasn't so good during the campaign, mm -hmm. but it's really good now. At the local level, that's where the problem is because the business model hasn't caught up. So we really don't know how to subsidize this kind of important truth to power work at the city hall level, state house, on the streets. Let's take a look at Pete Hamill talking about covering 9-11. Anybody who can place you in the moment and make you feel what he was feeling in that moment has done all the job you can ever ask for a reporter or a columnist. And Pete did that that day. I yell to my wife, run, and we start together in this immense cloud, perhaps 25 stories high, is rolling at us. Bodies come smashing together in the doorway of 25 Bessie Street, and I can't see my wife. I keep calling her name and saying, I've got to get out of here, please, my wife. Go, 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 go. I thought he's following me. me. Finally, Tom Buck and Oh my gosh, he's not here. And I said, oh my gosh, I felt 
made the worst mistake in my life. I felt that I had failed her somehow, that I should have been with her hand in hand all the way. Jonathan, I found uh, Jimmy and Pete very different characters to work with, very different personalities. What did you draw from profiling them? What, what is the difference between them that you saw? You know, on the surface, they seem the same. They're these Irish-American street reporters. But Pete was, uh, and still is, a, a poet, almost. Uh, as Robert Corwich says in the film, it's almost like reading something out of a f good French novel. And the column that he wrote that day that you, we, we didn't see in that clip was maybe the single finest piece of writing about what happened on 9-11. It ran in the Daily News. Jimmy was uh, much more of a, a gut puncher. You know, what happened yesterday with this rat-tat-tat style that had its own kind of poetry but really felt more of, of the street. And they were very different personalities. Uh, you know, Pete is beloved by everybody who's ever come into contact with him. Jimmy, who died in 2017, very controversial character and had his, his great moments when, when you adored him and then other, other times when you felt like strangling him. And <laughs> we, we, um, we saw some of both, although he had mellowed a lot as he got older. I had seen some of the old Jimmy uh, 25 years ago mm -hmm. when uh, I, I uh, dealt with him, and at one point he, you know, he said, "I'm the John Gotti of journalism. Like I'm going to come get you." You know. I think some of that yeah. was cultivated. Uh, yeah, some of it was cultivated, but they were very different personalities. What was fascinating, though, was they were such nice friends, good friends, and there's a sweetness to parts of our film uh, where where you see them together, and um, and so part of it is about the passage of time, and then Jimmy's life takes a very tragic turn. Uh, and they the had enormous respect for each other. Yes, they did. Thanks to Jonathan Alter with uh, John Block and Steve McCarthy, the director of Breslin and Hamill, Deadline Artists. It's available on HBO Now, HBO Go, and On Demand. I'll have some additional thoughts on CODA next. If you're thinking of not voting for public advocate next Tuesday, consider this. Whoever wins and would automatically become mayor if there's a vacancy could squeak in with the support of less than 1% of the New Yorkers registered to vote. Do the math. 17 candidates, 4.6 million voters from every party are eligible. Perhaps 10% will actually show up. And it's a nonpartisan election, so the party labels that they're running under are made up names. Names like For the People, or Common Sense, or Equality for All, or Fix the MTA, and even for the short sighted No Amazon. Here's a spoiler alert, though if you want to vote for Republicans, Eric Ulrich is your man. If you're still undecided, you might also be asking yourself, why the job exists at all. The public advocate replaced the city council president, who sat on the board of estimate and wielded real power. The board was abolished because it gave a little borough, like Staten Island, the same vote as a big one, like Brooklyn. Most of the board's powers were delegated to the council, where the public advocate does nothing except cast a vote in the extremely unlikely event of a tie. In 1993, the first election for public advocate drew a dozen candidates, including the comedian Jackie Mason and a Bronx City Councilman who had served time in federal prison for overstating his assets. The job's chief attraction, besides helping people, of course, is the public exposure that might make it a stepping stone to higher office. That worked for Bill de Blasio and for Letitia James, whose election as state attorney general last year created the current vacancy. After a generation, though, it might be time to redefine the job or maybe rename it. Originally Fred Friendly, the Charter Commission member responsible for choosing a name, 
suggested that while he didn't want to be a spoil sport, to underscore the post-redundancy, quote, appendix might actually be the best title. Titles matter less than leverage, of course, but they're not unimportant. Woody Allen once wrote that after simmering for years, the Russian Revolution suddenly erupted when the serfs finally realized that the czar and the tsar were the same person. New Yorkers may be in for a similar shock next week. When you leave the polls on Tuesday, you may be handed another piece of paper. Given the vagaries of our election law, whomever wins will serve only until January and has to run again in the primary this June. Tuesday is the first day for them to circulate nominating petitions. For the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.